Hello, and welcome to New York Metropolitan Transportation Council Program Finance and Administration Committee meeting. I'm Ian Francis, representative of New York State Department of Transportation and acting chair of PFAC. This meeting is being recorded and will be posted on the NIMTIC website within the next two weeks. This is our first in-person meeting since the pandemic began. However, several of our voting members are participating in the meeting today remotely from their offices. The New York State Open Meetings Law allows the remote participation of voting members by video, video conference as long as these meet members are participating from locations which are available for in-person public attendance. This is the case for the voting members participating remotely today and the locations they're participating from have been posted with the meeting notice on the NIMTIC website. Additionally, the public also has remote access to the meeting via the meeting webinar. For the meeting, attend for the meeting audience who are on the webinar, your lines will, be, will remain muted throughout the meeting. The chat pod is available for your use and is being monitored by NIMTIC staff. Any comments that are typed in the chat pod that are relevant to transportation and planning will be reviewed and included in the meeting in the meeting tonight. During the public participation section of the agenda, registered participants will be called one at a time. Registered speakers who are participating remotely via the webinar will be called on and their lines open for their statements. At this time, I will begin the roll call. When I announce your agency, I ask that each representative state your name and the NIMTIC principal you're representing. For the voting members, I'm Ian Francis, representing New York State Department of Transportation, Commissioner Maria Teresa Dominguez, New York City Department of Transportation, Yogesh. We can't hear you. Please unmute your line. Yogesh, you're still on mute. Dale, can you please unmute everyone? Okay. I, I am unmuted now. Yes. Uh, Yogesh Sangui, representing Henry Gutman of New York City DOT. Thank you, Yogesh. Now, New York City Department of City Planning. Jack Schmidt, representing City Planning Commission Chair Marisa Lagos. Thank you, Jack. Metropolitan Transportation Authority. Julia Seltzer, representing Acting Chairman and CEO Jana Lieber. Thank you, Julia. Nassau County. John Sally, representing County Executive Laura Curran. Thank you, John. Suffolk County. Chris Chatterton, representing County Executive Steve Ballone. Thank you, Chris. Uh, Rockland County. Doug Schutz, representing County Executive Ed Day. Thank you. Putnam County. Sandra Fusco, representing Putnam County Executive Mary Ellen O'Dell. Thank you, Sandra. And Westchester County. Craig Leader, representing Westchester County Executive George Latimer. Thank you, Craig. Um, now for the advisory members. Port Authority. Jay Schofield, representing the Executive Director, Rick Cox. Thank you, Jay. Uh, New Jersey Transit. We'll come back to New Jersey Transit. North Jersey Transportation Planning Authority. Now, hi, this is David Barron, representing NJTPA Executive Director, Miriam. Thank you, David. Uh, New York State Department of Environmental Conservation. Back to New York State DC. Federal Transit Authority Administration. Dan Moser, representing Region 2 Administrator Stephen Goodman. Hi, can you please repeat that? I didn't hear you. Oh, thank you, Dan. Okay. Federal Highway Administration. Gautamani, representing Division Administrator Rick Marquis. Thank you, Gautam. And United States Environmental Protection Agency. Okay, thank you. Matt is on. 
I've got Matt Louise on me. Okay. Thank you. By my count, under our operating procedures, we have a quorum for today's meeting. We will now give a we will now be given a presentation titled My Service Clean Transportation Program by Adam Ruder. Adam is the Assistant Director of My Service Clean Transportation Group. The Clean Transportation Group focuses on developing and demonstrating new technologies, policies, and business models that support three key areas, electric vehicles, public transportation, and mobility management. Adam has led the implementation of New York State's Charge New York initiative to advance electric vehicle adoption in New York State, and he closely collaborates with other states and the federal government to jointly advance EV policies and programs. Would you please unmute Adam's microphone? Hello, and, and uh, thank you for having me today. Uh, can you hear me okay? You can hear this one. Thank you, Adam. Okay, great. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to, uh, to be here with all of you today and uh, and speak a little bit about what uh, NYSERDA is doing uh, with regard to clean transportation and how that fits in with all of uh, the great work that NIMTIC is is doing. We have been close collaborators, as as you noted, with a number of the. Uh, the participants in, and members of NIMTIC in the past. And uh, so I think a lot of you are probably already familiar with some or all of our work, but uh, it's a great opportunity and, and I thank you again. So NYSERDA, uh, you probably are familiar with NYSERDA in general, uh, the New York State Energy Research and Development Authority. We are a public benefit corporation that has been in existence since 1975. Uh, we have worked in across really across the range of energy and clean energy uh, solutions since our inception on renewable energy, energy efficiency. Uh, but we do have a clean transportation program which uh, probably doesn't get as much attention as some of the other uh, larger programs that we have. Um, and we really focus on uh, the innovation side of what NYSERDA does, uh, the market development side, and the policy development uh, side. We have a few main uh, focus areas, electric vehicles, public transportation, and mobility management. And, uh, and right now we are investing uh, more than $200 million in, in these areas in, uh, across the state. So I first wanted to just cover a few of our market development programs. Um, First, our New York Truck Voucher Incentive Program, which is a partnership with New York State DOT and New York State DEC, uh, is using uh, almost $60 million to support medium and heavy duty uh, clean vehicles, uh, trucks, buses, and uh, repowers. Um, these are upfront uh, incentives at the point of sale. So the incentives come directly off of the purchase price of the vehicles. Um, and we do involve the manufacturers, dealers, and fleets uh, in the process. Uh, one key element of this program um, is that scrappage of old vehicles, uh, 2009 or older vehicles is a requirement. Uh, so we are not only getting clean vehicles onto the road, but we are also getting many of the oldest and dirtiest uh, diesel engines off of the road as well, uh, making a, a major difference in air quality in uh, across the state. Um, I noted that we this is a partnership with DOT and DEC. Uh, we have money coming both from uh, U.S. DOT uh, through the CMAC program uh, through near state DOT, and uh, we are using a significant portion of the uh, Volkswagen settlement funds for that are being administered by DEC uh, for this program as well. Uh, and you can see that we have a range of vehicle types that are uh, eligible for the program and funding, uh, funding sources. Uh, we, the vast majority of the funding goes to electric vehicles. And even within that, uh, quite a bit of this money is targeted at vehicles that are operating in and around vanished communities. So uh, this is 
not just targeting improvements in air quality in uh, across the state, but in the in some of the most impacted uh, communities across the state. Um, we also offer a rebate for passenger vehicles, for passenger electric vehicles, um, the drive clean rebate. Uh, we recently added $30 million to the program and, and uh, have seen a great amount of, of uh, interest in the program recently. Uh, we have over 60 models now available uh, in the state of electric vehicles, which is up uh, probably double since the program started, at least double since the program started in, in 2017. And we've seen a, a real influx of applications, especially over the last year. Um, we've received more than 42,000 uh, applications that we've approved so far. About half of them are for plug-in hybrids, uh, electric vehicles that can plug in, run off of uh, grid electricity, uh, for a certain amount of range and then have a gasoline uh, engine to go further if, if that electricity is exhausted. And about half have gone toward all electric vehicles uh, that typically have longer ranges, uh, some more than 300 miles today. Um, and uh, so it's about 50-50 right now but in the program overall, although over the last year it's been much more heavily tilted toward all electric vehicles and we see that as where things are going in the future. And uh, more than half of the rebates have been issued to uh, buyers in the NIMTIC uh, in area, in the New York City metro area. Uh, Long Island alone accounts for nearly a third of all uh, EV rebates and all uh, electric vehicles that are on the road in the state. Uh, today, there are approximately 80,000 electric vehicles on the road in New York State. The way this rebate works is similar to the other program, that it is a point of sale rebate. So the rebate comes off of the purchase price of the car. Um, and it is up to $2,000, although uh, the rebate amount varies based on the electric range and the purchase and the uh, suggested retail price of the vehicle. NYSERDA and uh, our sister agencies in New York State offer a number of programs on the uh, electric vehicle charging side of things. Um, last year, the Public Service Commission uh, approved a $700 million uh, ratepayer funded investment in uh, what's called make ready uh, aspects of the charging infrastructure. So this is uh, all of the costs of in equipment and installation up to the charger itself um, to bring power to the uh, to the charging station, which can at times be as much as half or more of uh, the total cost of installation. Uh, this is going to allow the New York State's six investor-owned utilities to install more than 50,000 EV charging stations by 2025, uh, up from about 8,000 today. This, as well, has a significant component that's targeting disadvantaged communities, uh, including $85 million prize competition, uh, which I'll talk about in a moment. Um, the New York Power Authority, in addition to this, has an Evolve New York program, which uh, is investing $250 million in DC fast chargers. So this is the, the picture on top here. Um, these are uh, charging stations that can add more than, you know, a, more than 100 miles of, an, of electric range in about 20 minutes. Uh, some of them are even higher powered than that uh, across the state. This is really building out a backbone of charging infrastructure to make sure that people can, can drive anywhere uh, and feel comfortable in an electric vehicle. Sorry, my... Uh, light sensors are a little overactive, uh, you know, we, we do a, a good job with energy efficiency here. Um, we, NYSERDA also is offering two programs uh, for electric vehicle charging. We have a Charge Ready New York program, which is focused on level two charging, the, the picture on the bottom, um, and that is really appropriate for uh, public parking lots and, and workplace locations and multifamily building locations. Um, these add 
somewhere between 20 and 40 miles of electric range in an hour. So if you're parked for a few, for a few hours, you can get, uh, or even an hour, uh, you can get quite a bit of charge and uh, uh, to complete your daily travels. And we also are investing some of the Volkswagen settlement money in fast chargers as well. Uh, and that's primarily upstate right now, so uh, not, not as much in the NIMTIC uh, region, but uh, we, we do have grants to really try to fill in some of those areas of upstate where uh, DC fast chargers are, are scarce. In the downstate area, uh, there are approximately 4,000 uh, charging ports uh, already installed, and you can see the map uh, on the right. This is primarily the uh, J1772 connector, which is the level two uh, chargers, but uh, there's a growing number of fast chargers as well. And uh, including, you know, mostly, mostly Tesla chargers, which can only be used by, by Teslas uh, right now, but also a growing number of the, uh, the two other standard connectors, uh, Chatamo and, and uh, uh, CCS combo connector. Um, so we are we are seeing quite a bit of an increase in uh, installations of charging stations, and they really are um, pretty pretty uh, you know pretty ubiquitous in in the downstate area. Uh, we are obviously looking to do more there because that's where a lot of the electric vehicles are, and and uh, there are a lot of businesses, a lot of municipalities that could certainly install. Moving on to some of the innovation programs that we've run, um, I, I want to emphasize the clean transportation uh, prizes, uh, which I mentioned earlier. This comes out of the Public Service Commission uh, order from last year. Um, these are prizes that are meant to uh, address innovative, replicable solutions in our communities. Uh, they are all community-based uh, challenges. One is the Clean Neighborhood Challenge, uh, Clean Neighborhoods Challenge, which is really far focusing on addressing air pollution uh, reduction associated with switching to transport, electric transportation. One is about electric mobility, uh, which is about providing safe, convenient, and active and electric mobility options that meet community needs. And the third is an electric truck and bus challenge, uh, which is about truck electrification, but also reducing the costs uh, and operational challenges of further deployment of, of these vehicles. Uh, the first uh, phase of the program, applications are actually due next week. Um, uh, August 24th is one, August 25th is the second, and August 26th is the third. Uh, we hope to have more to share about these programs um, in the coming month, and, uh, and we're really excited about what we're going to be getting in through these programs. We've also done a lot of work on transit and mobility, and I know this is obviously uh, a big focus of, of many of the uh, participants in, in NIMTIC. Uh, we have a longstanding collaboration with New York State DOT uh, to jointly fund research projects that are around feasibility studies and demonstrations of underutilized solutions uh, for improving mobility and reducing emissions in New York State. Uh, some good examples of the types of things that have been funded through this are um, innovative uh, approaches to adaptive traffic signal uh, management, uh, innovative approaches to virtual transportation management system uh, in, in Mount Vernon that we recently funded. Uh, we've done TDM and complete streets programs, shared mobility programs, um, in really across the state, but a lot of the focus has been downstate. Um, we also have a really exciting partnership with MTA and through their uh, Transit Tech Lab initiative with the partnership for New York City, where uh, a number of small companies and uh, that offer interesting solutions for MTA and, and also uh, it's expanded to Port Authority and City DOT, uh, have gone through an accelerator uh, process to to test out the solution, see if it might be a good fit, and MTA has then selected some of those projects to go on to do demonstrations, and we've helped to fund some of those demonstrations that have been most uh, 
relevant to energy savings and emissions reduction. Um, you know, we, we help to fund some of the bus route redesign software and, and things like that. Um, we also have worked on transit, uh, transit other tra types of transit technologies, whether, whether that's electric buses um, or wayside energy storage for uh, capturing some of the regenerative braking energy that's generated when subway trains and, and, uh, and commuter rail trains break. And we also do work on electric vehicles in the innovation space. Uh, we've looked at managed charging uh, to help reduce the, the peak amount of energy used and, uh, and how much electricity is used uh, for one, when we do roll out EVs more broadly. Um, and we've looked at cold weather performance and reducing the cost of charging and, and really making the charging experience uh, more, more palatable and, and more uh, more efficient. We've done a lot of data collection to try to inform the market about what actually uh, what actual savings are are available and and how that's uh, being rolled out. And and we've worked on better ways to engage customers to really uh, inform them and and gain gain more interest in uh, purchase of. And lastly, I just wanted to touch on a few of the uh, policy initiatives that uh, that we are very involved with right now. Um, you probably are familiar with uh, the Climate Action Council, uh, which is a group that was appointed in 2020 uh, to meet, uh, develop a plan that, that will meet the goals in the 2019 Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act. Um, and uh, they appointed a transportation advisory panel to develop recommendations on how to achieve uh, the greenhouse gas emissions needed from the transportation sector. Now, NYSERDA is also uh, working uh, on a project called the Clean Transportation Roadmap, which has helped to inform some of this work, uh, really doing some of the uh, modeling and analysis required to help understand what we can do to meet these emissions reduction targets. Um, and we have been sharing that analysis with the uh, Transportation Advisory Panel to inform its recommendations. The Transportation Advisory Panel recommendations were shared with the full Clean, uh, Climate Action Council in May. And, uh, you know, I, I just wanted to highlight a few of the key uh, findings and recommendations uh, here. Uh, these recommendations are not necessarily going to all be adopted by the Climate Action Council, and that's uh, a process that's ongoing right now. Uh, the Climate Action Council will be issuing a, a full plan at around the end of this year, and uh, I believe there's a there's a Climate Action Council meeting on Monday uh, for anyone who's interested. They they meet monthly, but you know we see a a focus on. Um, both either electrification or a mix of electrification and, and switching to hydrogen fuel uh, is a key element of, of, the, of re reaching our greenhouse gas emission reduction targets. But uh, there's also a key element of managing vehicle miles traveled to help control that emissions growth and minimize the cost and, and necessity of uh, converting more uh, vehicles to zero emission. Um, there is a key role for regulatory approaches. Uh, that is a major driver of the, uh, of the transition to electrification, uh, but that alone is not enough. We do need to focus on awareness and acceptance of electric vehicles, incentives, marketing, uh, removing sales barriers and financing barriers, and also focusing on increasing transit use, increasing transit availability, and uh, shifting our, our land use patterns to be more uh, transportation efficient and, and focusing on smart growth principles. Um, we can do this. Uh, Market-based mechanisms are a key element of this. Uh, you know, that is one way to, uh, in particular, to raise revenue and to ensure that some of these emissions reduction come. Uh, and there does need to be a strong emphasis on equity from the start. Um, and that really cuts across all of these areas. There's equity concerns around electrification, around smart growth, around you know, extending transit and uh, multimodal opportunities to communities that don't have it now. 
so those are all uh, all considerations that need to go into the plan. And I know that was quick, but uh, uh, thank you very much. I'm happy to answer questions, and I really appreciate the opportunity to come speak with you and, and look forward to working with all of you uh, moving forward. Thank you. Uh, are there any questions from the members? I have a question, Ian. Uh, Adam, thank you. That was a great presentation. Uh, I just have a couple of quick questions. Uh, in New York City, on hot days, we get these lovely missives from Con Ed asking us to turn down our air conditioners, not use major appliances. Um, I didn't see anything in your presentation about efforts you're taking to strengthen the grid. Can you speak to that a little bit? Sure. So the that certainly is a focus at uh, at NYSERDA more broadly. That's not what my the transportation program is focused on specifically. But uh, certainly, you know, from a transportation perspective, one of the key things that we are trying to uh, account for um, is that um, is that as we are talking about more electrification. Uh, of the transportation sector, we know that uh, that could potentially put an additional strain on, on the electric grid. So we are trying to understand what the impact of uh, on the transportation sector of the transportation electrification on the electric grid will be um, and try to make sure that transportation uh, electrification EVs, when they are charging, they're charging at off-peak hours, so it isn't contributing to that to those peak um, those peak challenges. But uh, there is a recognition that between transportation and buildings and and other uses, there could potentially be additional strain on the electric grid, and that's something that is a focus. Of. And just one more question quickly. I noticed that um, more than a third of the adoption of people buying EVs took place out on Long Island, which to me makes a lot of sense. Um, larger homes with driveways, places to charge these vehicles. Um, what does that look like for a New York City apartment dweller that might want to, you know, purchase an electric vehicle, go green, and, you know, where would they charge, um, you know, living in an apartment in a dense environment like the city? It's a great question. Um, we are working very hard to increase the availability of charging stations at multifamily buildings where there is parking on site. Uh, New York City DOT has been working on a pilot uh, with Con Edison of on-street charging. Um, we also have been focusing on workplace charging because, you know, if you don't have uh, if you don't have charging available at home, but you are driving to work, that's another great place where you're going to be uh, regularly and be parked for uh, a while. So you could actually get a, a quite a, quite a bit of charge at work as well. But there is a need for public charging for people who don't have uh, charging at home. Uh, that is that is going to be a needed uh, continuing challenge that we're going to uh, work to work to address. Any other questions? Well, I actually have a question. We hear about conversion from gas to electric vehicles, but the question that's come up, people have asked me a couple of times is, what's the cost comparison? Not necessarily the vehicle, but the operating cost. You know, the gas you've got to pay 239 or whatever for gas, but how do we charge the electric? <laughs> I'm sorry, 329. <laughs> Let's see what the number is. 329, I think I paid this morning. Yeah, it's a it's a good question. So the total cost of ownership, uh, we we've looked at the total cost of ownership and where it stands uh, for electric vehicles versus gasoline, and and also for trucks on on the truck side, uh, where it looks what it looks like for you know electric versus diesel. And we found that uh, they are getting very close to each other, actually, on the, on the light duty side. Um, we think that in the next two, three years, uh, the total cost of ownership for electric vehicles is going to fall below the total cost of ownership for gasoline vehicles in many cases. Um, the purchase price of the upfront purchase price, we expect to fall below the or equal to the purchase price of gasoline vehicles probably later this decade, 20, 
2027, 2028 timeframe. The, the costs, especially associated with batteries, is falling rapidly. Um, for trucks, we, it's going to be a little further out, but some, it really is very dependent on the duty cycle and the type of truck. Um, you know, transit buses often uh, look quite good now, although, uh, although um, they can charge at high powers, power levels, which can affect the cost of ownership. Um, we're seeing we're seeing that that also by the toward the end of this decade, the total cost of ownership should definitely be lower uh, for most types of trucks uh, on the electric side versus the diesel. Okay. Thank you, Adam. Are there any additional questions? Okay. I have a Hi, question Adam. about the cold weather performance. Is that an issue with electric vehicles? That that's a great question. Um, you know, cold weather, bat batteries don't really like cold weather, uh, and there are ways to design the battery system that uh, minimize the impact, but uh, cold weather can be, can be a challenge. Uh, the charging rates typically aren't as high, and uh, the range can, be, uh, can, can take a hit. But uh, we have seen improvements, and uh, even just better HVAC systems, more efficient HVAC systems in the vehicles uh, makes a big difference. Uh, you know, the difference today from 10 years ago uh, is, is quite impressive. And you're seeing some vehicles, the Tesla, the new Ford Mustang Mach-E, uh, they're seeing much better uh, cold weather performance than some of the earlier uh, EVs. All right, thank you very much for your presentation. That was extremely um, informative. So as you were saying, with the increased acceptance and growth of electric vehicles at, alongside all the different incentive programs taking place, is there any, um, have there been studies that are being done to assess whether as the continued growth in electric vehicles occurs that we will be in a position to be able to have enough charging facilities to meet the demand of the growth of the industry, um, i.e., if, if we talk about fuel and potential fuel shortages that we've seen in the past, is there any concern that we could run into a situation like that if we do see a really quick um, growth in electric vehicle ownership as we're seeing with, with different um, policies that are taking place that are going to really push it in the coming years? We are looking at that. Uh, yes, we, we are doing some work with NREL, the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, uh, which is uh, one of the DOE, uh, Department of Energy uh, National Labs, um, looking at what type, how much charging infrastructure is needed over the coming years. Um, we have, fortunately, we have a lot of investment that's going into charging infrastructure already through this uh, Public Service Commission program through the NIPA program that through through our initiatives um, <clears throat> and so we are we're definitely keeping up pace right now uh, it may need to accelerate at some point and we are trying to identify what types of charging are most are going to be most needed and how much charging and and you know hopefully where to really try to target growth in in those areas Hi, Anna. Um, you kind of laid out an interesting, um, you know, portfolio of things that include both electric vehicles and, and transit. Um, one of the things that I regularly hear from, from transit advocates is concern that incentives for EVs are going to um, encourage more driving instead of a transition to transit. And one of the things that you mentioned, the uh, workplace charging, um, being available to people that don't have charging at home, for example, you know, creates a scenario where people might actually be incentivized to drive to work when they otherwise might not. So I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, anything you may be doing to prioritize or target the efforts to try and um, get optimal outcomes between that mix of EVs and, and transit. Sure. That's, that's a really important uh, point that, you know, we, we see electrification of transportation as a key driver of emissions reduction, but not at the expense of all of the other great work that we're doing to try to get people out of their uh, single occupant vehicles, you know, and, and out of 
um, and, and on to transit or other uh, low carbon modes of, of transportation, whether it's biking or walking or, or carpooling or whatever. Um, so we definitely you know, don't want to be encouraging people to uh, forego transit because they have workplace charging. Um, we also are working at the same time on, you know, trying to uh, develop better, you know, uh, TDM plans that, that uh, you know, transportation demand management plans that employers can offer and looking at ways that we can encourage uh, municipalities to offer additional modes so that you don't, so that people aren't dependent on their, on their uh, vehicles, uh, their personal vehicles. But um, you know, all these things have to work in concert with each other. Uh, you know, one alone isn't necessarily gonna, um, you know, gonna gonna solve the problem. Uh, the one thing I will say about workplace charging is that uh, many employers do uh, charge charge for use of the, that workplace charging. So it's not necessarily. Uh, sometimes it is a free benefit. Others at times it's not. But. Um, is not necessarily going to uh, be such a benefit that that someone would give up taking transit just just for the ability to charge at work. Okay, thank you. Well, I don't think we have any more questions. So, Adam, we appreciate your presentation. It was very insightful. Thank you very thank much. You. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. All right. So. We will now start the public participation segment of the meeting. We've set aside 15 minutes of the agenda to hear from participants who registered to speak who will prepare remarks. We will hear from these participants in the order they have registered for the duration of the allotted time. We ask that all participants limit your comments to relevant transportation and planning related items and to less than three minutes so we can hear from as many speakers as possible in the allotted time. The first registered speaker is Murray Bowden. Murray? Please please. Thank you. Presentation that I brought at James Bond Studios. Going forward is okay. How about cleaning up the bed? Now I gotta start again. <laughs> Sorry. Don't charge my time. Now we can hear <laughs> The presentation I brought this morning I changed listening to this. Going forward, there's a good view. I'm going back and look at what we have to clean up in the past. Sitting outside is this 511 New York. When it was started and you put the signs up, it was valid. Now, everybody has cell phones. It's something that's no longer useful. How do you shut it down? The only people working for it are going to be out of the job. So you got to take the signs down because you don't want people to call on a telephone to find out something that's already there on Waze or Google Maps or Apple Maps. Yesterday, today's Thursday, yesterday there was a webinar, federal webinar about writing rules for the manual uniform traffic control devices for cars that drive themselves. I know some of the people uh, there, Paul Carson, I know for 20 years, he's a good man. This is the picture it's on on your desk that they used. It's 100% wrong. It's outdated. I told them about it beforehand. They used it anyhow. New York State DOT. That's your department, right? You're in charge. No. <laughs> I know Ron Epstein told me years ago that they were screwed up. And our own that seems to be co opted. I know it because I met him here. You're just putting up signs, guide signs, diagrammatic signs, with little bitty dots between them. On a Kosciusko bridge, they put up new signs with arrow per lane. How did you let them put up diagrammatic signs that nobody can see? 
And I've talked about that for years, and nothing happens. So until you clean up your department, what he's saying up there is pretty irrelevant. My family since 1930 was in the cleaning, the dry cleaning business, laundry business, almost 100 years. I earned my living running a dry cleaning plant. My son has it. Most dry cleaning plants are closing. This is the shirt that you can sit out. It's specifically designed not to be tucked in. No tuck shirt. They got it for my birthday. So everybody that made a living in dry cleaning, most of them, 90% of them, lost their business. Concrete is out. You have to build bridges, cable state bridges like they did after World War II because they used lost material. You built one of these things across eight lanes of traffic. Use twice as much steel, twice as much concrete, and you're talking about the environment. You're growing cotton in the desert. Grand Coulee Dam is just shut down for the first time. There'll be no water distribution to Utah, parts of Utah and Arizona. We're growing cotton in the desert. We're growing corn to make ethanol. He's right. But how about cleaning up the past? How about giving drivers the correct information? Because you stand in a light turns green, nobody, some people don't go because they're texting. And when they look up, they got to see yellow on the left, white on the right, so they know which way to go. So who fixes it? I'm 88. I'm going to die really soon. I can feel it. So what are you going to do? If you can't clean up the Department of Transportation and do this so there's always yellow on the left and white on the right, so the guy who's texting and like and the horn goes behind him and he looks up, he sees which where he's supposed to go. It's logical. He's right. We're going to have electric cars. They're going to figure it all out. But how about cleaning up the mess of getting rid of the people who work this and take the signs down? You put up signs the wrong way, they're facing the wrong way. On a storm of the parkway, they face the people going up the hill. You put out arrows on the ground, don't enter. It's 20 feet, it's 30 yards inside the thing. Put it in the front so the guy doesn't come in and sees it immediately. Use the European arrow, which is straight lines. Oh, we have the fancy arrow, you gotta spray it on the ground. That's all energy, fella. You're doing repair work on it, you got three trucks behind it. When they designed three trucks to close the lane of traffic, they didn't have the bumpers behind it. Coming down on the saw on the Henry Hudson Parkway, they had three trucks behind, two cars cleaning up the, the with the sweepers. So what are you gonna change? I'll be dead really, really soon. I can feel it. 88. How many people get? Every time I look at the paper in the morning, more people are dead than a lot. They're younger than me. Hey guys, until you can get rid of 511, it's a joke. He's right. But if you don't clean up the mess that's there now, going forward is. Oh, one more thing. MTA. Just announced on the mayor, it, to the last two days, they're closing down the Rockaway Yards so that they can insulate them and raise the water level. Jano's doing it because they know the water level is going to come out. They don't want to flood the, the rail yard like they did last time. That's two days ago. Within the last two days, they announced that. They know the water's coming up. The MTA is taking steps to go forward. They're raising the wall and protecting the rail yard now. Within the last two days, they announced I read. They're doing the right thing. You're not. Thank you, Are there any other, any other registered speakers? No, they're not, Ian. Thank you. So, now we'll begin the action items on the agenda. All material related to these action items is a 
posted on the Nintech website at www.nintech.org. The first action item is to accept the June 17, 2021 meeting synopsis. I ask for all voting members to announce your name and the agency you represent when you make or second a motion. May I have a motion to accept the June 17, 2021 meeting synopsis? Motion, Chris Chatterton, Suffolk County. Thank you, Chris. Is there a second? May second. Uh, Yogeshwar, Sangwe, New York City, DOT. Oh, thank you, Yogesh. Okay. Is there any discussion? If not, we will now vote by roll call. As you vote, please state your name and your vote. Starting with the Lower Hudson Valley, Putnam County. Aye, Sandra Fusco. Thank you. Rockland County. Aye, Doug Schultz, Rockland County. Westchester West County. Aye, Kirk Luger, Westchester County. And on Long Island, Nassau County. Aye, Sean Sally, Nassau County. Uh, Suffolk County. Aye, Chris Chatterton, Suffolk County. Great. Uh, City DOT Melissa, the New York City Department of City Planning. Aye, Jack Schmidt, New York City Planning. And finally, MTA. Aye, Julia Seltzer. And I vote aye from New York State DOT. Thank you all. The motion passes. The next action item is to adopt resolution number 524, the Transportation Conformity Determination for the Federal Fiscal Year 2022 to 2025 Regional Transportation Plan and the Federal Fiscal Years 2020 to 2024 Transportation Improvement Program as amended. I'll ask Fola Aiden of NIMTIC staff to introduce the resolution. Thank you. Uh, NEMTEC uh, conducted transportation conformity determination, which was publicly revealed in the month of June and July for the fiscal year 2020 through 2024 transportation improvement program as amended and 2022 through 2050 draft regional transportation plan. The emission analysis demonstrates that all applicable mobile source emissions tests are met for pollutants and analysis here as specified in the state implementation plan for air quality, thus demonstrating transportation conformity. NEMTEC respectfully requests that PFAC adopts this transportation determination. Thank you. Thank you, Fola. May I have a motion to adopt resolution number 524, the Transportation Conformity Determination for the Federal Fiscal Years 2022-2050, Regional Transportation Plan of the Federal Fiscal Years 2020-2024, Transportation Improvement Program as amended. So moved, Sandra Fusco, Putnam County. Is there a second? Second, Jack Schmidt, New York City Planning. Thank you, Jack. All right, we'll, we'll vote by roll call, starting with the Lower Hudson Valley. Putnam moves the motion to Rockland County. Aye, Doug Schutz, Rockland County. Thank you. Westchester County. Aye, Craig Later, Westchester County. Nassau County. Aye, Sean Sally, Nassau County. Okay. Suffolk County. Aye, Chris Chatterton, Suffolk County. New York City DOT. Hi, Yogesh Mingui, New York City DOT. Thank you. City Planning second of the motion, so MTA. Hi, Julia Seltzer, MTA. And New York State, I say I for New York State DOT. Thank you, the motion passed. Okay, on to the next action item, which is to adopt resolution number 525. Recommendation of the draft federal fiscal years 2022 to 2050 regional transportation plan and the draft congestion management process status report for council adoption. This action is required by NIMTIC's memorandum of understanding and the operating procedures before adoption by the council principles. I will ask Jen Khan of NIMTIC staff to introduce this resolution. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, 
just let me get this up there for a moment. Um, chairman PFAC members, as the chairman pointed out, I'm Jan Khan from the NIMTEC staff, and I'm really happy to present uh, resolution 525, uh, through which we are asking you to recommend the draft federal fiscal year 2022 to 2050 regional transportation plan and draft 2021 congestion management process status report for council adoption. Uh, before I ask for your adoption of this resolution, I'd just like to share with you some um, background and facts on the regional transportation plan and the congestion management process. The next regional transportation plan, which is the 2022-2050, Plan. Uh, sorry, it, can, uh, sorry. can you can you share your screen? Sorry. Okay, one second, please. I'm sorry. Thank you. Uh, you're seeing that now, Fido? Yes, we are. Yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you very much. Sorry about that. The next uh, plan, as I was saying, is named uh, Moving Forward. And, um, you know, really up front, I'd like to say thanks to the, or we'd like to say thanks to the principals for providing a really sustainable vision that will move the uh, region forward. And also thanks to the to members of the public, um, all of the members, advisory and voting members, uh, the NIMTEC staff, the consultant team that put this together to help us to put this together. And of course, um, members of the Federal Highway Administration, Federal Transit Administration, and NISDOT for, for, you know, for providing the requisite guidance to help us uh, de uh, develop and finalize this draft plan. So what is moving forward? Moving forward is a long range transportation, regional transportation plan that covers all modes of um, surface transportation and it, from a regional perspective. It is a federally uh, required planning product that defines the region's long-term transportation needs and desires. And it's a guide for federal funding of investments in an intake planning area based on the members' vision for the region. This, what this chart shows is how the regional transportation plan, aka moving forward, fits into the metropolitan transportation Process. So if you start with the regional transportation plan, then we move on to the, the um, unified planning work program, which defines improvement. It's really, uh, it could either be a one year or two year prospectus. And then of course, from, from all of that, we get the transportation improvement program, which is really the enabling document, which defines scheduling and funding for projects and there are two uh, mandated processes, the congestion management process, which you'll hear about in a moment, and the regional emissions analysis, which you heard about from FOLA. And of course, finally, there is the project planning and implementation, which is done by um, all members. <laughs> to, to get to the draft uh, moving forward, we there was a robust um, public outreach program undertaken um, by the members and the staff. And that program included online regional workshops, online an, on use of an online engagement platform, um, use of online focus groups, uh, primarily for communities of concern and users of specialized transportation services. And we also did Polish, a Polish survey of a thousand respondents. And then finally, uh, the preliminary draft was subject to a formal 30-day public comment period. Uh, and those virtual review sessions was, uh, were held um, in July of 2021. Um, and I should say that most of the public involvement um, work we did was um, through the, because of the pandemic um, was really virtual. Um, as I said, the principles gave us a really sustainable vision, and that vision, um, you know, through that vision, the, the 
NEMCAC plan aspires to ensure that mobility provide reaches everyone in a sustainable, healthy, and equitable manner. Um, we aspire to invest efficiently for these transportation needs and to respond effectively to the transportation challenges of tomorrow. Now, to, to achieve that vision, um, the Council identified six guiding principles, and that those are to consider the needs of users of the transportation system to make the best use of federal resources, to monitor performance, and if to support uh, multi-agency approaches, to engage the public, and to harness technological advancements. To get to the vision and the guiding principles, um, we identified, or the, the council identified and organized around five proposed goals. And these are safety and security, reliable and easy travel, planning for changing demand, reducing environmental impacts, and resiliency. Uh, I apologize, but something is not right here. I'm missing a few slides, but the, the next few couple of slides would have said that would have fully described those goals. For example, the safety and security goal would have said uh, a transportation system that ensures the safety and security of goods, people and goods across all uses and modes. And similarly, reliable and easy travel and the other three goals are would have been fully um, described in the next two slides. Um, that said, um, while we're really on a path of a shifting paradigm for transportation in the NIMTEC planning area, our plan is really still very much demand-based. And uh, to enable us to determine what that demand would be, we needed to forecast um, you know, what the future would, would look like. And these are the um, primarily the forecasts uh, which we use to develop um, moving forward. These would be the socioeconomic and demographic forecasts, which are, you know, the metrics for population, employment, labor force, number of households, which these, these metrics were forecasted in five-year interval, intervals um, to the plan horizons, plans horizon year of 2050. And very important, is that adjustments were made to the forecast to reflect the short-term impact, the short-term impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic and the resulting economic uncertainty. Now, there are, of course, the travel uh, forecasts. These, um, the SED forecasts were used as input into the NIMTEC uh, best practices model, which gave us a travel forecast. And we also looked at freight forecasts, which were developed through the um, 2018 transearch data, which is really a massive database for uh, freight information. This is just a quick idea of what the, tra the travel forecast for the NIMTEC planning area looked like between 2019 and 2050. And as you can see from that, um, you know, trips are forecasted to increase over the plan period, and so too are daily VMTs and vehicle hours which is vehicle miles traveled and uh, vehicle hours of travel. This is a, a quick picture of what the domestic, domestic freight flows um, are. And it's similarly, um, you know, freight flows will increase in the NIMTEC planning area between the period 28 uh, to the period um, 2045. The freight plan in the appendix, of course, expands on this, and it, re it makes really interesting reading and provides a lot of analysis for folks who are um, interested in what freight will look like over uh, the coming years in the NIMTEC planning area. Um, in Chapter 3 of the plan, 
we do describe technological, behavioral, economic, and environmental changes, um, the beginnings of which are quite evident today, of course, and those that will affect um, the region, the region's overall uh, mobility. And these are listed here. Um, these are the, some drivers of transformative change, which we've examined. And these include from the COVID-19 pandemic to distributed manufacturing and everything in between. And then there are large scale disruptors, uh, which we also considered when developing the plan. And um, these include climate change, extreme weather events, energy transformation. You heard a lot about energy just now, changing demographics and uh, changing land use patterns. I should say at this time that, um, you know, the plan is made up of I mentioned chapter three just now. The plan is made up of five chapters and eight appendices. Um, in chapter four of the plan, we, we talk about the goal modules. And what, what we did here, and every time I say we, I mean the members and staff. Um, for each of the five vision goals, um, we presented information in the following form. We described the goal, we talked about the relative objectives for those goals, because that's really, really important in achieving the goals. We, we described the trends, conditions, and existing initiatives for that particular goal. We talked about recommended strategies and actions. And um, since we'd like our plan to follow federal requirements, this plan is uh, much more performance driven than than our previous plan. Um, the recommended strategies and actions, um, we group those into planning and research initiatives, data collection, forecasting and performance assessment, uh, planning process recommendations, and program recommendations. Of course, um, you know, a key component of the plan would be the investments which allow us to realize principal's vision or, the, or NIMTEC's vision and achieve the plan's goals and objectives. Um, moving Forward recommends numerous projects, programs, and studies to improve the movement of people goods during the planning period. These recommended improvements and actions fall into two distinct categories. There are the program projects that are in the plan's fiscally constrained element and aspirational projects, proposals, and studies that are in the plan's vision element. Program projects, um, just so you know, or which you do know, are sufficiently developed that estimated, where estimated costs are defined, but in the aspirational vision projects, these are relatively undefined and in almost all cases do not have an identified source of funding. These are the, some of the plan's special elements. Um, which, which help us to meet the federal requirements. And these are pedestrian bicycle element, the coordinated public transit, human services transport, transportation plan, which deals with um, transportation for specialized populations. There's a regional freight plan. There's an environmental justice and title six assessment, an important facet of the plan. And then it, there is environmental mitigation and new consultation. These are, these do form uh, part of the eight appendices, which I mentioned. Of course, we have to pay for the plan, and that's chapter five of the plan. Um, federal regulations required at the financial plan include the following. System level estimates of costs and revenues, reasonably, reasonably expected to be available to adequately operate and maintain federal aid highways and public transportation. Key emphasis here is on federal aid. Uh, we have to provide estimates, and we do, of funds that will be available for the implementation of the plan. And we are allowed to describe additional financing strategies in the plan, which we have done. This graphic here gives you a flavor of um, how, how the um, financial plan is broken down. Um, there is operations and maintenance. The forecasted cost of that is approximately 906 billion. 
And then there's the other side of uh, maintaining and operating the system and, and, and developing the system that, it, that will be system preservation and system enhancement, um, which together cost about $800 billion. Uh, and we've calculated that the estimated funding envelope, the revenues that could come to the region over the life of the plan would be approximately $800 billion. Eight hundred and five billion dollars. Um, you know, system less system level estimates of costs um, are those that are reasonably expected, and and um, revenues are those that are reasonably expected to be available to operate and maintain. Again, the federally supported system. Um, the system preservation. These are costs related to the life cycle replacement. Re rehab, refurbishment, and reconditioning of components of the federally um, supported system and system enhancements refer to the um, extensions or improvements to the existing system. Some of the additional financing strategies we considered uh, include public private partnerships, value capture, debt financing, discretionary federal funding, and card and pricing. Now, that pretty much sums up um, the moving forward, the next uh, regional transportation plan. So I want to quickly move on to the congestion management process status report, which is also up uh, for your recommendation in, in, in uh, resolution 525. Um, federal requirements, since NIMTEC planning area meets the federal definition of a, of a, a transportation management area, or TMA, we must systematically forecast traffic congestion in the planning area, produce specific performance measures to identify levels of congestion. And in this um, CMP status report, there are about uh, eight to 10 performance measures. And we do need to uh, prepare a program to reduce congestion. So that's really what this CMP um, status report is, is about. Um, <clears throat> it, it does provide an overview of the, C of the congestion management process and the methodology that we've used in developing it. It presents the results of the most recent CMP analysis and forecast. Um, if, if, you go to the, if you've seen that report, you will see there's analysis that is done on the NIMTEC planning area level um, and at the individual county and or borough. Uh, level. And finally, it describes the strategies committed to in the plan to address the current and forecasted levels of congestion. So in a nutshell, that's that's both the um, a description, a brief descriptions of the um, regional transportation plan and the congestion management status report. Um, chairman and members, the draft 2022-2050 um, Regional Transportation Plan and CMP Status Report meet all of the applicable re federal requirements and, as you have noted, have undergone public involvement and review per the federal regulations. So, on behalf of the staff and the members, I'm asking for your adoption of Resolution 525 which recommends the adoption of the RTP and the CMP to the Council. Thank you, Jan. May I have a motion to adopt resolution number 525, recommendation of the draft federal fiscal year 2022-2050 regional transportation plan and the draft congestion management process status report for Council adoption. So moved, Kirk Luder, West County. Thank you, Kirk. Is there a second? Second, Sean Sally, Nessa County. Thank you, Sean. All right, we'll vote by roll call. Starting with the Lower Hudson Valley, Putnam County. Aye, Sandra Fusco, Putnam County. Thank you, Sandra. Rockland County. Aye, Doug Schutz, Rockland County. Thank you, West Chester County moved the motion. So, uh, Nessa County second moved the motion. We'll move on to Suffolk County. Aye, Chris Chatterton, Suffolk County. Okay, New York City DOT. Aye, Yogi Sangui, 
York City DOT. Thank you. New York City Planning. Hi, Jack Schmidt, New York City Planning. Uh, the MTA. Hi, Julia Seltzer, MTA. Thank you. And finally, New York City DOT also says I. So thank you the most in passes. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next action, the next action item is to adopt resolution number 526, amendment to the state fiscal year 2021-22 Unified Planning Work Program. I'll ask State 2 Allen of NIMPIC staff to introduce the resolution. Hi, good afternoon. So PFAC resolution number 526 has a series of actions requested by the New York City Department of Transportation, primarily to increase funding using reprogrammed funds for some of their special studies that are programmed in the 2021-2022 UPWP, as well as revise the scope of, scope of work or the UPWP description for the truck route effects and communication tool studies. No new funding is requested for any of these actions. Therefore, uh, NIMSIC requests that you adopt this resolution. Thank you, say too. All right. Um, do we have a motion to accept resolution number 526? So moved, Doug Schutz, Rockland County. Thank you, Doug, Rockland County. Is there a second? Second, Jack Schmidt, New York City Planning. All right, thank you. All right, let's vote by roll call, starting with the lower house in Valley, Putnam County. Aye, Sandra Fusco, Putnam County. Thank you, Sandra. Rockland moves the motion, so Westchester County. Aye, Craig Leader, Westchester County. Okay, Nassau County. Aye, Sean Sally, Nassau County. Uh, Suffolk County. Aye, Chris Chatterton, Suffolk County. City BOT. Aye, Yoga Sangri, City BOT. Thank you. City Planning seconded the motion, so MTA. Aye, Julia Seltzer, MTA. Thank you. And New York State DOT also says aye. Thank you. The motion passes. Okay. The next council meeting to adopt NINTIC's next regional transportation plan will be on Thursday, September 9, 2021, at 11 a.m. The agenda for this meeting will be made available two weeks prior to the meeting. The next PFAC meeting is scheduled for Thursday, November 18, 2021. Details of this meeting will be made available two weeks prior to that meeting as well. Now, to conclude today's meeting, I will ask for a motion to adjourn the meeting. So moved. Okay. You'll get that week. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Is there a second? Second, Chris Chatterton, Suffolk County. Thank you. If there are no objections, then this meeting is adjourned. Thank you for coming and participating. Thank you.